page six. Okay, so we start we stop with uh, an insulin correction factor to correct for highs that are not going to be covered by the bolus that's going to cover those that's going to cover the food. Okay, so making adjustments in insulin dose once therapy is initiated. So here is where if you're going to adjust, you usually are going to try to adjust just one component at a time and make small adjustments in that. So you wouldn't change usually the bolus and a, a basal dose at the same time. Because if you change the basal dose, you will lower everything. If you change a bolus dose, the blood sugar after that downstream will be lower. So it's better to change one aspect of it at a time. And then making those small adjustments. So for type 1s, make small adjustments, about 10%. Insulin timing. So we talked about yesterday when you, uh, the rapid acting are about 15 minutes before a meal. You can manipulate that or you can teach patients to manipulate that based on what their blood sugar is. If their blood sugar is just a little bit higher than what they want before a meal and their target is what? What's the target <coughs> pre-prandial blood sugar? 80 to 130. Okay. If it's a little bit high, then what they can do is take that bolus insulin and wait maybe five more minutes. So they can wait longer, let that insulin bring their blood sugar down, and then eat. So they can manipulate that. If their blood sugar is normal, let's say it's 80 before they are ready to eat, they could wait and take the insulin right about the time they eat. Because if they take it at all and wait very long, it's going to drive it too long. Okay, so you can manipulate that time interval to your advantage. Or they can manipulate it to their advantage. <clears throat> Meal size or carbohydrate content. Uh, so to get blood glucose value before a meal to target range, the patient can use food to help manage control. So let's say they're coming into lunch, their blood sugar is a little bit higher than usual. They can lower the carb amount of their usual lunch, take their usual insulin, and let that bring it on down. So what I, what I want you to take away from that is that you can manipulate different parts timing, food content, as well as insulin, uh, in order to adjust a blood sugar. Sometimes people will use exercise. If their blood sugar is a little bit high before supper, go for a 20-minute walk, and that will lower blood sugar. Okay, so there's multiple ways to do this. Let's say they're going to go out and mow the lawn after lunch and so and they know that that will drive their blood sugar down so they can either they can what we would prefer they do is take less insulin but they could eat more carbs take the same amount of insulin and then that exercise will drive them on down Look under that second bullet. Increasing the amount of carbohydrate eaten or increasing the, milk, the middle size of a meal uh, if the blood glucose is below target or more activity is playing can be a slippery slope, especially if the person is overweight. In this situation, for an adult, it would be better to decrease the amount of bolus insulin. To me, it's always better to get rid of drug than it is to add more drug and eat to match that. If activity is planned, then it's better to increase the amount of carb eaten. So if a kid is normal size, they're going to have, they're going after their soccer game, you have them eat more carbs, that will take care of that, that will cover their activity. Contraindications to intensive insulin, intensive insulin therapy, hypoglycemic unawareness. That is a condition that happens usually over time. Uh, to people, especially with type 1, 
their nervous system, their central, their sympathetic nervous system will be attenuate its response to a low. So a repeated low. So eventually they will no longer have an adrenergic response. So when blood sugar goes too low, one of your counter-regulatory hormones, norepinephrine, is released to, uh, to raise their blood sugar quickly. Okay. Over time, the body will quit doing that. And so their blood sugars will just continue to go down unless there's an intervention to raise them to eat. Okay. So that happens over time, usually by about 15 years of type 1. Most patients will have hypoglycemic unawareness. Another time it happens is when people have a profound low, so they get down into the 40s, they, re, they, they have a sluggish response for a period of time to any other low. So it takes time to recover. That's why you really want to avoid those lows because they will eventually, that it will hasten uh, their, the time to when they are hypoglycemic and awareness but it also, the next time they have a low, they, they will not have warning signs as quickly. <clears throat> so blood sugar drops, you get an adrenergic surge, makes you want to eat. You get tremulous, you sweat, you get hungry, headache, tremulous. Those are the things that warn you, you need to eat. Okay? They lose that. Okay? So we want to keep that system intact so that they will be aware. Uh, Counter-regulatory unresponsiveness. So people lose most of their glucagon responsiveness. So what would glucagon do for a type 1? It increases glucose output for, by the liver. So if they lose that, then they have lost the ability to respond to a load normally uh, after about 5 years. And then that catecholamine responsiveness to hypoglycemia after about 15 years. The better you can keep their blood sugar controlled, the more those systems will stay intact and work for the patient. Okay. Other uh, reasons not to use intensive, you don't want to do it in the, in the old, old. Depends on how well they can do things. I mean, some old folks do very well. Uh, so you're going to have to gauge it. Uh, so you're always weighing the risk of hypoglycemia with the risk of hyperglycemia. So here we would allow those uh, A1Cs to float up a bit to maybe seven and a half, keep them under eight uh, percent. So that's going to keep their average at about 150 or so. The likelihood they will fall low it will go down considerably. <coughs> those that are debilitated, short life expectancy, uh, malignancy, especially if we're asking them to eat more uh, in that situation, you would allow their blood sugars to float up a little bit. Okay. Questions over that? On yeah. The, the PDF that was for the ADA stance on physical activity, I thought it said that um, exercise increased blood glucose. Is that for type twos? Or is it can if you're if you're insulin deficient. So usually that occurs once you get over about 250. Okay. So that's why we haven't checked before. Okay. So if they're above 250, type one in particular. Okay. Uh, we want them to get, take insulin, get their blood sugars down, and then once their blood sugars have come down, then exercise. Okay, common causes of increased fasting blood sugar. So that fasting blood sugar really is an important number because it's where you start the day. And, it's, and it reflects heavily what happened overnight. Um, so, you want to look at why are you high in the morning. So it can be due to a lot of reasons. The most common reason I found for most people is what did you eat the night before? So they went to bed, or they went to bed, they ate a lot or something. Uh, so finding that out, what are you snacking on? Um, now I don't look at snacking as bad, but I ask them, well, why, why are you snacking? Do you feel low? Or are you extremely hungry? It may tell me that I'm giving them too much insulin um, at, at supper. So I want to know the reasons for snacking. If it's habit, it's entertainment eating. Um, usually I want to ask them, check your blood sugar. Check your blood sugar before you eat, before going to bed. And let's find out what it is. Maybe the carb content is too high. 
Some people will eat because they're worried about getting low overnight. They've had lows before and they have been frightful. So, okay, that's, that's something else to look at and that we can manipulate their insulin so that that doesn't happen. Or we can have them uh, eat an appropriate mix of proteins and uh, carbohydrates in order to keep them high, higher overnight so that they don't have a low. Um, so snacking is one thing. <clears throat> Uh, one is that maybe their insulin is wearing off. So if they take a basil in the morning, then if that insulin does not last 24 hours, then it will attenuate, it will wane. And so their sugars will start to rise. One of the things that, um, if you look on the next page, is called the dawn phenomenon. And everybody has this. Uh, so as you're getting ready to get up uh, in the morning, to come to class, about 4 o'clock in the morning, your catecholamines start rising, your cortisol's already rising, uh, and it's getting you ready for the day, and glucose goes right along with that. In you all, your insulin keeps track with that, so you don't get too high. But people who are insulin deficient, their blood sugar in the morning will be high because of that dawn phenomenon. Those counter-regulatory hormones have caused a release of glucose, and so when they get up in the morning, it's higher than normal. Usually, I see, I've seen this more in type 2s. Uh, what you'll see is that the only time their sugars are high are first thing in the morning. And then throughout the day, they go kind of normal. And then overnight, when they're putting lots of glucose into their system, there's not enough insulin there to cover it, so they wake up in the morning with high fastings. So when I'm talking about high fastings, I'm talking in type 2s with that dawn phenomenon. You'll usually see it between 120 and 190, something like that. So not huge. But in type 2, it might be even more pronounced. Especially if the, so look at that basal dose. That's why a lot of times what I would like to do is, is move, for people who can do it and be consistent, is move that basal to noon. That way it, it, it didn't run out at night. It would come back around and if it was going to run out, it was going to run out early uh, in the middle of the day, mid-morning. Mid and I'm already using other drugs to cover that part of the day. Skipping a dose of insulin, pretty common. Did you take a dose of insulin? What did you eat and then did you take your insulin? Those would be the first two things I would ask. And it's consistent. So here's a time where I found that people would, would miss their dose of insulin at night. Older people falling asleep. So they sit down at 6 o'clock at night, they start watching TV, and they fall asleep. They wake up at 10 and they think, oh, it's too late to take my insulin, I'm going to bed. So that's where I start adjusting. Okay, then us setting your lunch to take your insulin at 8 o'clock at night is not going to work if you're going to sleep through it. So we'll move it to the morning time. Okay? Or we'll move it to noon time. So that would be, or in chaotic uh, uh, home life, you know, you got three or four kids and they're all in different things and you just can't remember and you keep missing it. So work with them on a consistent time. I always ask them, when's, when's the best time to do this? Oh, we talked about dawn phenomenon. Another phenomenon is called the Smoji effect, so people don't believe it. Um, um, it is truly a phenomenon, but it, you will see this, this happen, whatever, they're, whatever you want to call it. What will happen is that they will get a hyperreactive hyperglycemia to a low in the middle of the night. So what will happen is their blood sugars will dip and their counter-regulatory hormones will kick in, and so their blood sugars will go up. So what I usually a tip off to this is a couple of things. One is their blood sugar before they go to bed and their blood sugar when they get up are very different. Like they go to bed and you're 140, did you eat anything? No. And you're waking up with 220s? What's that about? Do you get up and eat in the middle of the night? No. Nope. Then I start asking, and I always ask about lows in the middle of the night. Are you having a low blood sugar in the middle of the night? So lows at night often are manifest themselves different than lows during the day. So I ask about, are you having nightmares? Are you having vivid dreams? Is your partner telling you, if somebody is in the bed with them, 
Is anybody telling you that you are very agitated at night, moving around a lot? Um, some of those are, are clues. I had one lady who used to work, wake up with just a terrific headache. And eventually we figured out it was her lows in the, that she was having in the middle of the night. So ask about lows at night. One of the ways you can figure it out is have them get up and check their blood sugar about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. It's really helpful. That's about the time they'll dip down if they're taking uh, bedtime insulin. So those five things are pretty common. So they become part of what I ask a patient about. What did you eat the night before? Did you take your insulin? Uh, when do you take your insulin? Um, are you having lows at night? Now they don't know the online phenomenon, but you can watch their blood sugars and figure that out. And if you're not sure, have them get up and check in the middle of the night. Two or three times in a, you know, a couple of weeks, you'll start to figure it out. Any questions about those? Okay, let's look at some let's look at some readings that a patient would bring in. Person, a woman who weighs 22, uh, she's 22, she weighs 50 kilos. She takes Lanta 16 units every morning. So, Lanta <coughs> is what kind of insulin for her? Basal. And her Novolog is four units before breakfast, three units before lunch, five units before supper. What should her blood sugars be before she eats? 80 to 130. So, look at those numbers, just look them over, and then tell me where the problems are. Okay, so what do you see? The first thing I look at is across the board. Across the board, what do you see? They're always high. So that tells me that the basal is not high enough. Okay, so that's the way I would interpret it. I'm never hitting gold, so the basal is not enough. Okay. So then I start looking at individual amount of time. So what about her fastings? They're elevated. So when I look at fastings, I look backwards. Okay, well, what were they before bedtime? Why did it do that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So before she goes to bed, what are her blood sugars? They're high. Okay. So if her bedtimes are high, then I probably didn't cover her supper very well. Or she snacked. So I want to know, did you eat? But look at her 3 a.m.s versus her get it, getting up in the morning. What are those like? They're the same. They're the same. So she's not having lows at night. So she's 147 at 3 a.m. and she wakes up at 159. So essentially the same. 180 and she wakes up at 182, centrally the same. Okay. So her bedtimes are elevated, so I want to know, are you snacking in between supper and bedtime? <coughs> Is there food in there that I'm not accounting for? Um, and your pre-supper, so look at, uh, look at pre-supper to bedtime. <coughs> 200 to 145, 170 to 150, 144 to 226, 198 to 140. What does that mean? Huh? Sometimes they go up, sometimes they go down. So what did I tell you that's at mostly like, likely due to? Could be snacking. It's variable carb intake at, at a meal. Unless they snacking, we'll just take that out for now. Okay. 
So if you're 200 to 145, if your basal is covering it, we would expect it to be the same. We expect you to be 200. So either she under ate her carbs or she took additional insulin. Now as patients, if they're paying attention, they're going to figure it out very quickly. And they'll start upping their dose. They'll start making adjustments. So you have to ask them, well, are you always taking it that way? Or have you, did you modify your amount of insulin? Maybe she took extra because she was 200. Um, but let's say she didn't. So that would account for, you didn't even eat as much carbs as you usually do for the amount of insulin that you took. Okay. The 170 to 152, that's the same. So whatever she ate, there's no snacking in there. It covered the amount of carbs in her, in her diet. 144 to 226, what happened there? She could have snacked or she way over ate her carbs. Pizza could be, could be, yes, could have been a high fat meal. 198 to 140. Probably not enough carbs, or she took extra insulin, okay? So those are things you have to ask. Now, what I usually will ask patients to do is, when something unusual happens, make a note over to the side. Had birthday cake, that <laughs> common. Uh, had cake, had ice cream, went out, okay? Then I look at pre-lunch, or uh, so I look at that. That tells me a lot about fasting. So she doesn't vary a whole lot from bedtime to, uh, to, to her morning. Okay, look at, uh, let's start with the fasting to pre-lunch. She's 165 to 152, 143 to 160, 159 to 122, 182 to 200. What do you see there? It's pretty much the same. So what does that tell you about the bolus dose? It's good. She's too high, but if I get her basal up, I can, I can probably leave that alone. So that dose of uh, four at breakfast is probably about right. People eat breakfast more consistently than any other in terms of food types at breakfast. Okay, pre-lunch to supper, pre-supper. So 152 to 200, 160 to 170, 122 to 144, 200, 198. What do you see there? Pretty stable. Pretty stable, except for that one day. But for the most part, so probably lunch is about right. So where's the problem? Supper to bed. Supper to bedtime. Okay, so supper's the problem. So if I was going to target a, um, a one of the, the bolus, I would target that. But so I got to decide. I told you to pick one or the other, since it's across the board. Personally, I would do the basal first, okay? And what did I tell you? How, what's her total daily dose? <coughs> 28. So how much percent did I tell you I would, you would change by? 10, so two or three units. So let's see what we do. Okay, so it went up to 18 <coughs> units of lantus. So we went up two units on the basal. And we kept her pre preprandial the same. So here's her blood sugars now. So look at those. In the same way I just did. Okay, so what do you see across the board? Better. Better. We're hitting our goals. Uh, let's look at our fasting. How often do we hit goal on fasting? Every time. I, my goal is always 75%. If I can hit goal 75%, I am I'm good. Leave it alone. What about free lunch? Pretty, pretty much all the time. What about free supper? Goal high. What about bedtime? The one thing with bedtime that's a little different is 100 to 140. So we allow it to float just a little bit higher for bedtime. Okay. What about our 3 a.m.? Good. Okay. So then I would start asking the patient, what are you doing between lunch and supper? Okay. Could be that a 90, maybe she gets low. Maybe she goes down and then she eats a snack. Maybe she tells you, well, midday I'm feeling kind of 
nervous, so I'll eat. So may reflect a uh, may reflect that may re reflect more carbs at lunch. So that would be how that would drive your questioning. Okay, does that help? Mm -hmm. Okay, so here we adjusted her um, lunch to four units, so we went up. So we found out she was, we weren't covering it well enough. So now we've got basil and we've got, uh, what about our pre-suppers? How do we do? Good. Okay. The next thing I do, anytime I start making adjustments, every once in a while I'll just check myself. So she's on 18 units is basil. How much bolus is she on? <laughs> Did it do it again? Hold on. Four, four, five, and eight to thirteen. Okay. Okay. So what's her total daily dose? Thirty-one. How much did she weigh? Okay, so somebody divide it. So she's thirty units per thirty-one units per fifty kilogram. What what does that come out to? Thirty-one five five six. Yeah, point six. Point six. Point six. Two. What'd you say? Point six. Zero What did I tell you they usually need? What's their usual dose? 0.5 to 1 unit per kilo. Okay, so I just check that. Where am I in there? Then the other thing I do is I check what percent is her basil now? Especially with type 2, sometimes we get too out of whack with their basil or they're giving it too much and not enough bolus. So my total daily dose is within the range expected for a type 1. My basil and bolus is within that 50 to 70 percent, 30 to 50 percent. Okay? And it's showing up. The other thing that would tell me would be your A1C. Because we've all done, we just done pre. The goals are established for preprandial. So you'll you'll hear a lot of people, you're gonna see practitioners out there always want them to check their postprandials. I always work towards getting preprandials done first, accomplish those first. Because that's where your goals are set, that's where the evidence is. So I get those in range first. Then I look at the A1C. Let's say with her numbers as good as they look. They came back, and probably with this it wouldn't, but let's say it came back 7.8%. I'm going, what? what is that? What is that? Her highs after eating are too high, and they're staying up too long before they come back down, and that's where the problem is. With these kind of numbers, you wouldn't see that. Uh, but. That's where the A1C will tell me, okay, my preprandials look great, but now I need to work on what they're usually what they're eating, more than likely. The type of carbs they're choosing. Too many uh, fast uh, metabolized carbs. Okay, questions about that? Follow? Mm -hmm. Follow that? Okay. Okay. Let's talk about lows. So your your um, your type ones are always going to be a little bit more fragile and more at risk for a profound low. They don't have the counter-regulatory um, counterbalance <coughs> is not going to be as intact. They lose a lot of that counter-regulatory uh, balance. Uh, and so it, they'll, it'll be different than the type 2s. So the type 2s tend to not get profound lows, but you can do it to them. I mean, they certainly can get it, but the type 1s will have uh, be at more risk. 
So when is hypoglycemia most likely to occur? These are the common times. They skip a meal, they delay a meal, they eat less of the meal, they, take a, 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 they calculate their insulin wrong, uh, or they're more active. I always make sure I go through these when I'm trying to figure out what happened. Delaying a meal comes up more often. Skipping a meal, a lot of them know not if they're going to skip a meal with their own intensive insulin, that's usually not going to be a problem because they'll just wait and take the, their preprandial when they eat. Who could get into trouble with this in skipping a meal would be those on a split mix. You took, an ins you took insulin in the morning, you ate breakfast, but you, when you got to lunch, you, you, didn't, you couldn't get to lunch or forgot your lunch or couldn't get any food. I don't know why that is. <laughs> oh, I wonder if it's on a, I may have recorded it at one time. I bet you that's what it is. Okay. So it'll probably keep doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be one. Delays, I find people getting them to um, always, always, with any of your diabetics on an insulin-lowering drug, Always make sure they're carrying a, a sugar source with them. I usually tell them not only to carry it on you, but stash it in places where you are likely to be. Men are notorious for not carrying sugar with them. So I tell them, okay, put it in your car, put it in your shop. Wherever you are a lot, have sugar sources there. Having your wife carry your sugar source is not, not going to help you. Okay, so it on you. Uh, and we'll talk about what, what would uh, be good things to do. So here's a common thing that I have seen happen multiple times. They are on their way home and traffic delays them. They're usually ready to eat at 6 o'clock and they're delayed. They have a flat on the way home. Had a man who was going to Guthrie one day. Thank goodness he had his grandson with him. He started to have a low. He realized that he was getting low. He pulled the car over. He had a nine-year-old grandson in there. And the grandson got out of the car and flagged down a highway patrol. So that ended well. But constant is what I'll hear out of a patient. Well, I just I couldn't get home in time. I underestimated the traffic. I underestimated how long it would take me to get home. There was a wreck. I had a flat tire. And then they, and they don't have any sugar source with them. So really important that they always carry something with them. Okay. So delay is a, is a common thing. The other would be um, increase in activity. Sometimes it's things that catch them unaware or it's things that they do on a periodic basis. Here's an example. Had a guy who um, saw from the VA and he'd bring in his blood sugar, he was a skinny type 2. Um, and he, and I would notice every Thursday his blood sugar was low. I said, what are you doing on Thursday? He goes, this is the day my wife drags me to the mall. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was the walking around, it was the increased exercise. I can't tell you how many times I hear it out of, why are you low this day? Why are you getting low on at the end of the you know the end of the week? So they go to Walmart and do my grocery shopping. Okay, so there is that added activity. You cannot underestimate how powerful activity can be on a blood sugar. Okay. I would love to talk to Walmart, find out how many times you have hypoglycemic <laughs> crisis in your because I hear it out of patients all the time. I went to Walmart and they weren't they didn't know the motorized carts were there, so I had to walk around. I swear to you, it's like I got there, the motorized carts weren't there, I had to get a cart and I walked around and by the time I walked around, you know, for an hour I had a load. Uh, another big one in the summer is mowing the grass, okay? So I always talk to them, the day you're going to do that, then let's talk about what you usually do. Do it after lunch, do it first thing in the morning, okay? Then eat extra or take less insulin. Easy. So if you're going to go to the grocery store, let's time it around uh, maybe a meal. You've eaten, so then you go. Don't get up in the morning, take your insulin, and go walk. I used to have a guy who drove a truck uh, all over the state, produce truck, and he would get up and take his insulin and then get on the road before he would eat. He goes, well, I just eat on the way. I'm like, ah! <laughs> 
So, <laughs> okay. Eat less of a meal than usual. Maybe you get interrupted. See, because they always take their insulin before. Uh, and so they've got to make sure they're going to eat the entire thing. Now, this is where that FIES may be a uh, uh, good for some patients. That's the one that has very quick onset. You can actually take it after you've started eating. It's a very, it's that ultra rapid. Um, but making sure people understand food and insulin go together. If you're going to take your insulin, you have to eat. We don't take insulin and then we eat for that. So it's we're going to take our insulin when we eat. Um, dosage error. Here's where I find most dosage errors. It isn't so much in the actual dose or what they're doing. They'll mix up their basal and bolus. So I've gotten a lot of calls where I just took 60 units of my Novolog, my bolus, which was their dose of their Lantus. So the only thing I do is send them to the emergency room because somebody's going to have to pump them with, with uh, glucose for a while until they run through the insulin. So that's a comment. So people's vision changes over time, their color vision changes. The pins are different colors, but if you can't appreciate it anymore, if your eyes are blurry and you can't read it, you just grab the first one thinking it's the right thing, then you realize. So that, that can be a problem. But the other would be is they're, uh, they're not calculating the carbs right. So they underestimate the, the, or they overestimate the carbs, they take their insulin, but there wasn't enough carbs there to, um, to be, to cover. Medical causes would be kidney function. So the, the ways that you get rid of insulin are liver and kidney. But the kidney really plays a big role. As their kidney function goes down, they can't get rid of the drug. So it hangs around longer. So as renal function deteriorates, their, their insulin doses will have to go down. Hormonal deficiencies, you're probably not going to see this very, this would be an unusual one for, for that. Rapid gastric emptying, these are very, not very common. Hypoglycemic unawareness would probably be the most common out of that group. So how do patients describe it? She's, she's real, this is a really good picture of what someone would feel like. Usually people will have two or three symptoms and they're usually pretty consistent for them. So common ones that I would hear out of patients is it's a sudden, sudden onset. I am suddenly, I have I've got to eat or I have got to sit down or it's a sudden um, weakness. Something's not right, I gotta get something to eat. Um, so those, so sudden onset, uh, shakiness is common, rapid heart rate, I don't know many that complain about that, but rapid heart rate, think adrenergic, okay, so it's the tremulousness, it's the sweating, um, the hunger, it can be an intense hunger, I have got to have something to eat now, okay, so the, yes, do you see nausea a lot? Uh, my no. roommate is hypoglycemic, and she gets nausea to the point of almost vomiting. No, I, I can say that I rarely ever heard patients uh, say that, but it's it's one of the ones people can have. Mm -hmm. uh, I usually would give people a, a picture list and uh, show them here's all the things, uh, it, and they commonly would have the ones that they were common for them. Uh, so people will have different cluster sets, uh, is what I found. The biggest thing is for people to be aware of what is happening and treat. They have to carry something with them. Okay. So let's look at mild, moderate, and severe. So stay with me. Some of y'all are certain stare. <laughs> so blood sugars will, as they fall, symptoms will, be, will increase. So most people in the 60s don't tend to get uh, symptomatic, but in the 50s, they will. Uh, it also depends on how rapidly they fall. So the body senses and, and, and monitors the rate over time. This sets off alarm bells. This may not set off alarm bells, okay? If you're rapidly falling, the body will set off an adrenergic alarm. Um, 
So if patients tell you, I, I like to keep my blood sugar above 200 because I feel better, okay? So, and if I go below 150, I get low blood sugar. Well, no, you, you don't have low blood sugar, but I do buy that your body could be telling you that your blood sugar is dropping too rapidly. That is a big fight with a lot of people who've run three and four hundreds and now you've got them down to, my body isn't used to 150. Well, okay, well we've got to get it used to 150 because you can't live at 400. Um, so, mostly I'll tell them, yes, I believe your body is telling you that it's dropping, but you are not in danger at 150 at all. You're not in danger at 90 unless you continue to fall and don't, don't treat it. So I do talk to people about that and I do validate, yes, you are feeling those symptoms, but you're, the danger you're in is, is not real. Or it's, not real is not the right word. Uh, your body is adjusting to a, a, a new normal. Okay, so if they're below 70, they should treat. Uh, if we can get people to check their blood sugar when they're having those symptoms, that would be great. That helps a lot with those 150s, people at 150 on low. Uh, it's like, no, you're not low, but let's teach you. So I'd like to have those numbers so we can talk about it. But if they're below 70, they need to treat. Okay. So what do you treat? You use a simple sugar. So you need simple sugar, quick release sources. Uh, this is the rule of 15. I want you to know this. People will talk to you about this. So eat 15 grams of carbs, wait 15 minutes, blood sugar will go up. So if people ever say that to you, that's what they're talking about. Okay, here is treatment of hypoglycemia. I love the lifesavers. I love it at Halloween where you can get those little packs of five and six. Perfect, perfect dose. Five or six lifesavers. Jelly beans are another good one to do. Um, I usually tell people if you're going to use jelly bellies, how many do you use? I think there's about 35 or 40 jelly bellies is 140 calories. So they do about half that, maybe 15 to 20. Uh, milk has enough sugar in it. Uh, orange juice, peppermint candies. Real soda, uh, sugar cubes. I love cocktail sugar, sugar cubes. They're cheap. You can get 200 for less than a, a dollar. Most people don't tend to snack on them, <laughs> so they don't tend to be tempting. I tell patients, don't, don't carry sugar sources that are tempting for you to eat. Um, packets of sugar are fine. Packets of honey are okay. I have a lot of patients who just steal them out of, you know, take them. Just take them out of the restaurant, carry them. Something you can carry with you and on you. Okay. Uh, I usually tell them, uh, buy a can of soda, real soda, and put it in the back of your refrigerator. Don't touch it unless you need it. And that way, if they run short, they've got it. Um, so any of these would work. Do not do complicated sources. Uh, chocolate will, is got too much fat. It slows down the absorption of sugar, and it will not treat it. Peanut butter does not treat your low blood sugars. Okay. Um, complicated protein uh, uh, fat sources won't do it either. So staying with uh, staying with something like that, these is good, and they're they're cheap. Butterscotch that would work. Don't use sugar-free candies. <laughs> Don't use sugar-free soda. These are more commercial products and they're fine. If patients want to buy them, fine. They're more expensive. A lot of people use cake gel, gel. And that's good. The only problem is how do you get the top off? So I tell them if you want to carry it, have something that you can clip that, that top off. As people's blood sugars go down, their motor coordination goes down. Um, so I have seen, we had a resident one time, that a pharmacy resident, she was type one. And one day she was really acting strange, and I figured out over time that when she was low, she transposed numbers. 
So one day we were sitting there, we were doing notes, and she started talking unusual. And she got up, and I said, where are you going, Candy? Her name was Candy. <laughs> and, and she said something unintelligible, and she started walking down the hall. So I followed her. I said, you think you're long? You think you might want to check your blood sugar? She wouldn't talk to me. Got to the, the soda machine. She could not hit the, the buttons to get the, she was just so uncoordinated. So we got her sugar and she did fine. But she was the one who told me she, her parents freaked out when she wanted to move out of the house and live by herself. So her dad bought her, I don't know if y'all ever saw them, but they had these um, telephones that had huge block <laughs> numbers so that, and that way she could hit those when she got low. She could dial her parents or dial 911. Uh, so she did fine. Uh, okay, so these are other things that you can buy. You can buy uh, rapid acting glucose tablets. They're a little bit more expensive, but they can be uh, easy to carry. Um, glucose tablets. Now the type ones I've had don't like that. It's told me they don't like those as much because when they get low, they, they have a hard time getting them out of the foil. Uh, the other is I tell if you're going to buy those fast acting, if you're going to buy a bottle, uh, be sure you take the, the strip off and you can open it and take the cotton out and the seal off so that if you have to get into it, you don't have to work through all that. Uh, but otherwise, any of these. The Night Bite and the Extend Bars were uh, actually formulated by a pediatric endocrinologist, uh, and they are meant for overnight. Uh, so she devised these for pediatric patients to eat and sustain their blood sugar uh, overnight so they didn't have lows. So those might be helpful for some patients. Okay. So let's look at moderate hypoglycemia. This is where they not only will have adrenergic, if they still have those responses, but they'll also have neuroglycopenic. So this is like the, uh, the steel magnolia scene with Julia Roberts, okay? Sometimes patients don't have any symptoms until they get to this point. Uh, these are usually when their blood sugars are in the 40s. Sometimes they will not recognize it, but their family will. Uh, they often can be, have a great uh, change in disposition. They can become very belligerent, very hard to work with, irritable, uh, foul uh, mouth. I mean, they, they become very resistant. Uh, they also can become very, um, they look drunk. They, their gait uh, gets off, their, uh, their uh, speech is slurred. I've had more than one patient thrown in jail. Uh, because of this, have one pick a, uh, picked up on the street for public intoxication thrown in jail. Uh, there was a guy who died last year in one of the local, not here, but in one of the smaller towns, uh, diabetic, put in jail, didn't listen to him, didn't get him his insulin, he died. He died in jail, yes. That was a big thing, maybe two years, in the last year or two. So uh, this one, patients usually are not capable of self, sometimes they're not capable of self-treatment. Uh, so they may need help in getting, and they usually will need more than one. So for mild hypoglycemia, 10 to 15 grams of carbohydrate is usually enough. It'll raise their blood sugar within 10 minutes. For moderate, they usually will need a couple of doses. So you give them 10 to 15 grams. Wait, see how they do. Their blood sugar will come up, uh, but they may need a second dose. Okay. So usually we'd like to get their blood sugar up to about 100 or so. If they are, were close to a time when they usually would eat, we'd want them to go ahead and eat. If they've had moderate hypoglycemia, it's probably a good idea for them to have a sandwich or in a glass of milk, something that, because they, they sometimes will dip down again. Um, severe hypoglycemia would be unresponsiveness. So these people would require uh, either IV. Uh, we had this happen when I was a resident, a girl across the hall from us that uh, was type 1, 
she had a severe hypoglycemia, and man, her roommate got her down on the ground. We called for the people to come. Our, we were residents, but we were we were housed in the old part of the hospital that they were going to condemn. This is where they put the residents. We're on the sixth floor, and as you'd walk down the hall, there was little bats that hung. So we had these little bats hanging. It's a crazy place to be. Anyway, she fell out. We went and got help, but her roommate was really good. She carried at that time a, a package that was called monogel. Mono gel was just a, a, a sugar gel. She laid her down on the floor and rubbed that stuff in her cheek. Uh, and eventually she came to before the help arrived, but I thought that was ingenious. Uh, but you, those people are not going to be able to swallow, so they're going to have to have like IM glucagon. So that's why we, we teach uh, patients or parents or family members to give glucagon, uh, or we will, or we need to get them uh, to uh, help. So those folks will need a, a great assistance. So going back to glucagon. So it comes in a, a kit like this. Little Lee sells it. It's expensive. It's a, they're about $100 a kit. Um, and they come, you see it, they come in a lipolized uh, powder right here. And they've got a diluent, so this is all set up. They, you can see right here, they shoot the diluent into the vial, they withdraw it, and then we teach them how to give an IM injection, usually just in the thigh. And this will buy you time. You have to get them to help, but it will buy you sometimes enough glucose to get them uh, to an emergency room or until emergency um, emergency people can, can show up with uh, IV dextrose. You have to write a prescription for this. Usually insurance will cover it, but you have to write a prescription. The only thing is that patients hate it, because if they're doing pretty well, they will spend $100 on this sometimes, and then it expires. Uh, so sometimes it's hard to get people to, to keep them around. But always in people who are really high risk, they should keep that. We talked about the 15-15 rule. The derm, we talked about those the other day, the lipoatrophy and lipodystrophy. The way we get around those is we tell the patient to do what? Rotate, Rotate sites. You can see systemic allergies. You can see local allergies are not uncommon. Um, so when, and this usually happens when a person starts a new insulin. So see that kind of just local, it'll usually be right around where they inject themselves. It'll be itchy red. Usually it'll last an hour or so around the time of injection, then it'll go away. Usually by the time they get through that first vial, it's gone. So you just, they can treat it with antihistamines and put antihistamine cream on it, and usually they will be fine. There are people who have systemic allergies. They have full-blown hypersensitivity reactions. Those people we rapidly desensitize. There are protocols that you can rapidly desensitize someone to insulin in about 12 hours. That usually takes a specialist, usually somebody who's done it before. I have only seen two in all my years. So they're very uncommon, uh, but they can happen. Usually it was more of a problem when we used animal source insulins. The analogs don't <coughs> tend to evoke as much of an immune response. Okay. So this last page is about children. Some of the unique aspects of caring for children. Ooh. You really, if you are, especially if you're out in the um, more rural areas, know where you can send children. So I would initially, in family medicine, I would maybe be the first person who saw them, but I always got them in, uh, hooked up with OU, because that's where it was, with the Children's the Pediatric Endo Group. They're fantastic. Uh, they were so set up for kids, and they're so much better at it than I could do. 
and they have a team of people. So find where the groups are in the state where you practice and get them into those as, as soon as you can. You may be the person to stabilize them. Uh, if you're going to see kids and you think you might be in that kind of situation, find out from the group what do you want. Like I knew what the PEDS group wanted. I knew which antibodies they wanted drawn. I know what they usually started doing. I could get that done. I knew the person to call and I could get them in within a few hours to see a PEDS uh, end up. Okay. That's what I would suggest you do, unless you're in that kind of group. They really need specialized care and specialized education. Uh, let's see. Because kids change. They, you know, they're developmentally going through all of these different stages. So, and in each of those stages, there's different things you do. There's different um, ways that the child is going to react to having diabetes or uh, in their their need to have independence, especially when they hit teenage years, it's, a, it's just a, it's very difficult. Because there's a lot of rebellion, there's a lot, they want to be like their peers, they want to eat what they want to eat, uh, and that takes a special person. Then there is just the need to grow them to independence so that they can go away to college or move out or get married and lead independent lives. So, there's lots of developmental uh, things that need to be addressed, and the PEDS people are the best folks to do that. Um, so lots of change that goes along with that. Uh, it, you also have to deal with the school environment. Uh, so there's lots of rules there. There's lots of ways to interact with them and how to deal with school. A lot of, you'll get parents who will, they will be so fearful they won't send their kids to school. Uh, they'll keep them at home. So you have to work with parents as much as you do the, the kids. Usually the kids are easier in the beginning. Um, the hypoglycemia, the hyperglycemia with kids, how to handle that. Just imagine having it, if you have a toddler, if you've ever been around them and you're trying to, you're worried about, you got to get food in them, and they get real resistant. I mean, they can control food. So you're giving them insulin and they're not going to eat. Or if they're fussy, are you low or are you just being a two-year-old? You know, that kind of thing. So it takes a lot of, of uh, support. Uh, okay, glycemic control. So for kids, they changed it several years ago. They used to have for every age group a different value. So now we've got one across the board, less than seven and a half percent is our goal. You'll notice that uh, before meals it's 90 to 130 and bedtime is 90 to 150 because that's more the scary time, uh, especially for parents. Where there's one autoimmune disease, there's usually another. So there's now there's recommendations for two things that you should screen for. The number one is thyroid. Very, very common for type 1s to also develop type, uh, thyroid disease. So, it's recommended that soon after they're diagnosed with type 1, you screen them for, uh, with the TSH and the thyroid antibodies. So the ones you use are the antithyroid uh, para, peroxidase TPO is the name, and antithyroglobin globulin antibodies. Know that one. That's important. Very, very common. The celiac, celiac is also common, but not as common as what we see with T, uh, TSH. Uh, some recommend screening right away. Uh, some people wait until a failure to thrive uh, shows up. So you can screen early. Uh, if they're negative on an early screen, you still watch them because they can develop it at a later time. Uh, so failure to thrive, failure to gain weight. Uh, would be uh, concerns that later on you would also do the screening for uh, celiac disease. Because we know these kids have a disease that is, is, uh, puts them at more cardiovascular risk, even though not as much as we see with type 2, we want to pay attention to those. So family history plays a big role here in terms of statin um, in particular. So we're going to pay attention to blood pressure. Blood pressure for kids is just like weight. It goes by the percentile. Okay. Um, and, do I put it on this one? Maybe I do it on the one. 
Oh, I did it under the next, in our word, we're looking at complications. Okay, for screening for the lipids, actually, we're going to do all this in our complications, so I'm just going to wait, because I'm just going to go up. Let me go to the very last paragraph. One of the main, what a major um, difficulty in the life of uh, kids who have type 1 and is the of having to transition to adult type 1 care. So most pediatric groups that take care of type 1s, they are very hands-on, they have good relationships. These kids may have seen the same group for 10, 15 years. Uh, and they've been with them through all the ups and downs. Uh, and then they have to go see an adult endo. And it's cold, it's sterile, we're very, it's like, where are your numbers? Okay, do this. So it's, it's not the touchy-feely, and a lot of kids drop out at that point. So some of them drop out because they just don't like what they see. They drop out because they lose, if you're in the Medicare system, Medicaid system, you lose coverage. Uh, if you are uh, 26, I guess now, uh, you lose your insurance. So a lot of kids fall out for a number of years. I end up seeing a lot of them as adults uh, because they would go 10, 15 years, no insurance, and then, okay, I got insurance, so I pop back up. So transition of care has become a big thing with kids in pediatric to adult endos. Some pediatric endos hold on to kids till they're 25, 28 years old. Uh, those are the more rare. But many have started to specialize in those transition years and develop transitional uh, clinics to help kids move from the pediatric to the adult world, because it is a big difference. So help them with that transition. Uh, or if you're on the receiving end, understand that from them, is that they've been used to a very different high-touch care uh, as an, in, in the adult world, they don't always receive that. Okay. Questions? Okay, let's take a break, then we'll come back and finish up with complications. Um, go on. Um, <laughs> is this off? <laughs> 